Hello, I'm Marco Mäkelä, lead developer in Adibi at MariaDB Corporation. Today I will talk about uh, how we make data definition language operations crash safe in the MariaDB Server 10.6 release. So you may know that uh, MariaDB provides ACID transactions, atomic, consistent, isolated and durable. That only held for DML, data manipulation language operations such as uh, insert or delete, but not uh, to DDL until the 10.6 release. So in earlier versions with, uh, of MariaDB, if you, your server got killed at a critical moment while executing, executing alter table or create table or something like that, you could, uh, if you were unfortunate, you would get an inconsistent data dictionary or you would get corrupted tables. In the 10.6 release, we provide crash safe DDL operations and to achieve that we didn't change any of the existing file formats. We only introduced one new log file, DDL recovery log file, to make the, the provide recovery of uh, any, any in progress DDL operations during the crash. So there is an additional DDL recovery step and uh, during the execution of uh, DDL operations a file DDL underscore recovery that log will be updated. So this is an additional file in addition to the storage engine recovery log and, and the bin log. And for example if the server was killed during a rename table operation, if it was a partition table, then each partition would be re renamed separately, inside InnoDB at least. But uh, this uh, recovery log would uh, guarantee that uh, either the rename will complete for all partitions of the table or it will be re uh, rolled back for all of them. And similar for drop table or create table. For native alter table, which is executed inside uh, the storage engine, there is uh, an additional internal interface. So during alter table, the, there are two table definitions in the .frm files, the old one and the new one. And the recovery must ask the storage engine which table version is the, the uh, correct one. That is, was, was it this alter table operation committed or not? And then it will rename the file back or will delete the extra file. It should be noted that the DDL is crash safe but it's not transactional yet and uh, it is not even atomic for some operations. For example, drop database is being logged as uh, individual atomic uh, drop table statements internally. So if the server is uh, killed during the execution of drop database, then you might end up with any number of the tables in that database dropped once the server is restarted. Now some bi basics how DDL operations are implemented or were implemented in the InnoDB storage engine. Uh, InnoDB was conceived as a standalone database. It was integrated in MySQL 3.23 release in 2000 or 2001. So the .frm files and, and the SQL layer of uh, MySQL was an extra layer. And uh, the InnoDB dictionary was not really changed. Uh, it, it was only extended with this extra layer of, of the .frm file. So in InnoDB there are four hard-coded tables in the system table space. Sys tables which contains table names and uh, some other data. Sys columns, which contains information about the all columns in the table, one row per column. And then there is sys indexes, which contains uh, information about the indexes on the table. And finally, sys fields, which contains the key uh, columns of each index. This is a subset of uh, what is stored in the .frm files. For example, 
we don't store the default value expressions for columns inside InnoDB. It's only kept in the .frm file. Then there are some additional tables. Sys foreign and sys foreign calls contain the foreign key constraint information. And uh, in MySQL 5.7 and uh, MariaDB 10.2, there was a new table added, sys virtual, which contains information about the base columns of virtual columns. And uh, also there were tables, sys table spaces and sys data files, which were added in the MySQL 5.6 release and the MariaDB 10.0 release. The intention of these, uh, these uh, tables uh, was to provide uh, metadata for create table space and supporting table spaces inside InnoDB tables. But uh, this was not never implemented in MariaDB. It was implemented in MySQL 5.7, but not MariaDB for InnoDB tables. So it turns out that we can actually remove those two tables without any harm. It's actually easier that way because those tables were never updated in case of an upgrade from, from a 5.5 .5 release. You wouldn't have metadata for those, those uh, old tables in those system tables. So now in MariaDB 10.6 we don't have this sys table spaces and sys data files tables anymore. They are not updated, not accessed, not, not created at startup. Uh, to provide ACID we need locking and logging and uh, for tables an important locking mechanism is the metadata logs. It is a lock on the table name or on the database name. Generally any operation on a table will acquire a shared metadata log. And uh, it was this mechanism was also being used in some InnoDB internal operations starting with the 10.2 release. For example, if a, if a table contains indexed virtual columns, then the purge of transaction history would have the access to table definition in, in the SQL layer and for that it would acquire a metadata log. In the 10.5 release we always acquire a metadata log in the purge of history. And uh, the, meta, the main use of the metadata log is to provide uh, mutual exclusion of DDL operations. So if any operation is accessing a table, we do not allow DDL operations to execute at the same time. So any DDL operation would acquire an exclusive metadata log to prevent concurrent execution of DDL on the same table, but also to prevent concurrent execution of any operation of that same on that same table during the critical phase. This uh, exclusive metadata log may be downgraded and upgraded again. Is, for example, during alter table, there's a prepare step, then there might be a data copying step, and then after the copying, we will upgrade to exclusive metadata log again so that we can commit the alter operation. But during the copying, we can allow concurrent access to the table. Mm. So the domain of, of the metadata log is a table or a database. For example, in drop database, it will acquire exclusive metadata log on, on all tables in the ta uh, database. Or it could be global if you issue some backup stage command or flush tables with read log, it will basically acquire a metadata log on all tables. The scope or duration of a metadata log is a statement that is it's released at the end of the statement or it, it is transaction released at transaction commit or rollback or it is explicit so that uh, there must be explicit calls for acquiring and releasing the metadata log. InnoDB internal operations are always using these explicit logs. In InnoDB, we have some additional logging, uh, sorry, locking. Uh, there are some operations which do not acquire InnoDB table or index record logs. The purge of history and uh, the repeatable reads using multi-versioning concurrency control, 
they never acquire any inodb logs. They are only protected by the metadata log. Then we have inodb table logs. Typically during DML operations, we acquire an intention log on the table, intention exclusive or intention shared, meaning that we are going to log, uh, acquire ex uh, exclusive or shared logs on index records that we are accessing. And uh, on DL operations, uh, with the new refactoring, we are always acquiring an exclusive table log. But uh, in the past, it used to be so that the DDL operations are mostly protected by an exclusive, just uh, acquiring the data dictionary cache in exclusive mode. The dict system mutex and the dict system latch or dict operation log. The in the record logs, uh, before they can be acquired, there must exist a corresponding table log. And if a table log, uh, for example, if an exclusive table log exists, then we don't have to acquire any index record logs because that would be covered by the exclusive table log. And because there was not consistent uh, metadata log uh, acquisition inside InnoDB, Rollback and Birds used to acquire the dict system latch in shared mode just to prevent any concurrent uh, DDL operation from dropping the table or so. Originally in InnoDB there was a rather badly working DDL recovery. It was only implemented for create table and drop table and at most one table or partition could be covered in, in a DDL operation. So there was a header field, header field that was stored in the unlock header identifying the table that is being created or dropped. And in MySQL or MariaDB if you have a partition table then each partition is actually treated as a separate table in ADB. So you couldn't have atomic operation covering multiple partitions of a table, like creating a partition, partition table was never atomic inside in ADB. couldn't be because of this limitation. So the recovery was that uh, we would normally roll back changes to the data dictionary tables, but then there would be an additional step that uh, if we see some table ID in the unlock header, then we will execute additional DDL operation to try to drop that table ID from the dictionary. And there were also some additional hacks needed for for uh, the internal tables of full text index. So there was a step to drop any orphan tables, which uh, if, if there was a drop table that contained full text indexes, then the auxiliary tables belonging to that table were not being dropped atomically. So they had to be dropped separately on startup. Rename table was not really working. There was not proper redo logging for rename operations and there was no undo logging uh, for renaming the files. So if, if the server was killed during something that would rename a data file, typically you would you would get uh, the data file, a mismatch between the data file name and the table name. So in MariaDB 10.2.19 to have a proper backup of truncate operations, we, we had to implement better logging of rename operations. A new undo log record was uh, introduced uh, for rename table, but you could argue that it's uh, redundant because uh, we could uh, have passed uh, the undo log records for the sys-tables.name, the internal table. But unfortunately, this, uh, the primary key of the sys-tables table is not the table ID, which never changes. It is the table name. And in InnoDB, if a primary key is updated, it will be logged as a delete of the old primary key and insert of a record with the new primary key. So it would have been difficult to distinguish a rename operation from a create and drop operation. So this uh, new record made it easier. 
So I already mentioned this uh, problem that there was only one slot for storing this uh, table ID that uh, was subjected uh, to create table or drop table. Another severe problem with the old EnoDB DDL implementation was that uh, there was an internal trigger implemented for the sys indexes table. When EnoDB was executing a delete operation on the sys indexes table, it would immediately free the index tree that was associated with that record. And if the transaction was later rolled back or if the server was killed before the commit of the transaction was made durable, then you would uh, end up with uh, the sys indexes table pointing to something that is not a valid index anymore. And if you are unlucky, then these pages could be reused for something else and you would get serious corruption. You could get uh, several tables trying to access the same pages as if there were their own, uh, own, own pages. So it could co corrupt also other things than just this index. And uh, also back when InnoDB was integrated with uh, MySQL, I guess uh, at some point somebody noticed in internal testing that we have this problem that uh, the MySQL layer is trying to drop a table that is still being used or st still being locked. Instead of fixing that problem, uh, Heikki Tori added this hack background drop table queue. So if a drop table is attempted, then it will be in queued and it will be executed later. And this wasn't even crash safe. If the server was killed after something was added to the drop table queue, it would be forgotten on restart, you would, uh, that table would be, never be dropped. But that was fixed in the MariaDB 10.2.19 release. So there we have this uh, background uh, queue, but it's uh, persistent. It will be, uh, the tables will be dropped uh, after recovery because we will rename the tables to a hash SQL dash IB prefix so we can detect them. But anyway, this was not, uh, this is still not acid and uh, it's not acceptable for proper DDL implementation. Then we had uh, more trouble. InnoDB persistent statistics was introduced in MySQL 5.6. Uh, there are two system tables, InnoDB table stats and InnoDB index stats. And these are actually accessible to users. Users are actually supposed to be able to modify these tables so that they can change the persistent statistics of, of some table and uh, to, to have the optimizer to, to make the optimizer aware of uh, these tweaked statistics and there was not, not proper locking around this no metadata locking inside the InnoDB internal operations that modify these tables and also not proper locking or not atomic operation with DDL operations. For example, during an alter table uh, or uh, I guess alter table or drop table, we would uh, separately commit the DDL operation to finish the alter table or drop table and after that we would start separate transactions, not even single transaction but multiple transactions to update the statistics, to delete the statistics or to rename statistics when renaming table and, and so on. And uh, this would of course uh, lead to often entries or some inconsistency between the statistics tables and, and uh, the actual data dictionary. There were also hangs related to uh, background statistics auto recalculation. So how did we fix this? Uh, well, first let's look at the DML, data manipulation language. Why, why does that work? What is it doing right and could we learn something from it? So basic uh, primitives or the magic that makes ACID, atomic, consistent, isolated and durable work is locking and logging. And uh, for DML the basic locking and logging is actually page locks and redo log. Anything that is changed in InnoDB will be will be uh, implemented as uh, an atomic change 
to single or multiple pages and these changes are are encapsulated in entities called mini transactions so in a mini transaction the pages that are going to be modified they will be locked in exclusive mode no other modification will be allowed at the same time and uh, when that mini transaction is committed then a log for those modifications will be written to the redo log buffer and the page logs will be released there is no rollback of mini transactions it's only commit and once the log for that mini transaction from the global log buffer has been written to the redo log files then we do this right and this is the right ahead logging then we are allowed to write those modified pages to the data files but for durability what counts is that the, the redo log was durably written even if the pages were never written and the server was killed the server will be able to recover from that, that redo log and to make recovery faster we have this concept of log checkpoint it means that uh, we are writing pages modified pages back to the data files and uh, whenever the oldest uh, LSN of, of a modified page is moving forward, we may change the log LSN, the log, uh, log, uh, log checkpoint LSN to that. So we can logically discard the start of the redo log and the recovery could then start from that checkpoint LSN to the end of the log. So in, on a normal shutdown, the redo log would always be empty logically. So how do these DML transactions work? Well, first of all, every access to tables is covered by MDL, shared MDL. And any modification of tables is covered by InnoDB table logs. Typically intention, exclusive or exclusive. A delete operation will not delete data immediately. It will also only schedule the data for future removal. It will delete mark the records. And the removal can happen after commit. When there is no old review that might want to see the old data review that was created before the transaction was committed. Such reviews may still see the data, but once all those reviews are closed, then Perch is allowed to proceed and delete those delete marked records. And uh, like I said uh, for the previous slide, any uh, we have this right ahead logging, but uh, for Transactions, there is also this thing that uh, if some change is important, typically many tra mini transaction commits are not important. If you have a huge insert operation, it could uh, consist of uh, thousands or millions of mini transactions, but we don't really care if those are durable. We care whether the commit is durable. So once that huge insert is committed, then we must make sure that the redo lock up to the Edison that marks the transaction as committed is written, Europe written to the redo log. Then we can say that this was committed. So then let's compare this to DDL. It is very similar. Now with this revised design, every access to tables is covered by MDL, but that's exclusive MDL, not shared. And any modification of tables is always covered by exclusive InnoDB table log. And a drop operation or any DDL that is uh, going to delete files, it will not remove anything immediately. It will only schedule that for future removal after the commit has been durably written to the redo log. Of course, if, if the server there is no multi-versioning for DDL, so if the server is not killed after that commit becomes durable, it will delete the .ibd file immediately after that. But if the server is killed, then this uh, IBD file removal would, would happen in the purge of history after the server restarts. It may, may take, take some time because uh, there could be many other changes waiting for purge first. But it will be done. And uh, last point uh, of durability is that there are some additional durability requirements around uh, file system operations. If we are going to rename a file, we must first durably write a rename log record to the redo log. Only after we have done f-sync or f-data sync of the redo log for that, we are allowed to rename the file. And similar for file deletion. 
And one more thing that we fixed, uh, I think it was necessary for this DDL to be crash safe in InnoDB was that uh, we removed some hack around file creation. It used to be so that uh, when an .ipd file was created, we would uh, write a dummy first file to that page and do an f-sync of that write, so that the recovery would be able to read uh, something like the table space identifier from that first page. But that is actually violating write-ahead logging. Write-ahead logging means that uh, everything will be written to the log first, and there is no redo log record for this uh, write the first page, this pseudo thing. So we removed that uh, that uh, additional initialization of, of a dummy first page, and now InnoDB is able to recover just fine based on the redo log records. If, if it finds an empty data file or a data file that consists of only zero bytes, it will rem uh, remember that this is a special file, we need a special recovery for this, and uh, later af after all the redo log has been scanned, it will make sure that uh, it can recover that file from the redo log. If it can't, then it will flag an error and you can use the InnoDB force recovery to ignore this file. So how we made DDL more atomic? Well, it turns out that we didn't have to introduce any more undo log record types or redo log record types in InnoDB. We just had to improve the rollback and purge. I already mentioned that purge will remove .ibd files after commit, if the server was killed. Purge will do it after recovery, our server restart. Also rollback was improved. If a create table statement is being, or something that is creating a data file is being rolled back, then similar to insert, rollback of insert will delete the inserted record immediately, and the rollback of uh, create will delete the .ibd file immediately. And now with this new uh, setup we don't update this uh, header field, the table ID header field in, in the unlock header anymore. We leave it at zero, just like a DML transactions would. So we may easily modify multiple tables or partitions just fine in a single DDL transaction. And not only that, we can modify the statistics tables atomically in the same transaction. So if you drop a table, we will be able to delete the statistics for that table. No problem anymore. Same with rename table. And uh, it gets even better than that. Because we are protecting everything with metadata locks or exclusive InnoDB table locks, we don't have to hold these dict system latches in rollback or purge to prevent concurrent DDL. And uh, in fact, we removed the dict system mutex altogether in uh, the 10.6.5 release. So there is more concurrency. Tables can be looked up. Uh, concurrently if they are in present in the InnoDB table cache. So we got a much better throughput for some cases. So how does this uh, DDL recovery work? Well, just like DML recovery, we will recover data from based on redo log records and uh, we will roll back incomplete transactions that were recovered from the undo log pages that were covered by the redo log. For DDL we always did a synchronous rollback at InnoDB startup. For DML we do that in the background while the server is already accepting connections. Around native alter table there is some extra logic needed because to be able to implement this DDL log recovery step the DDL recovery will ask InnoDB whether the alter table was committed or whether this definition of the table is the latest one or if it if it is the if if the other dot frm file is the latest one. So for that, the InnoDB needs to know the transaction ID in the data dictionary tables, and to guarantee that during a critical section of 
committing other table inside InnoDB will, will disable the purge of any history, then the DDR, log, DDR recovery log will be updated and then purge can resume again. Or, or the DDL operation will be finished in the SQL layer and then purge will resume again. If the server was killed at that point, then we will not start purge of history before the DDL log recovery has been executed. And the log recovery will ask in ADB for the transaction IDs. And after that recovery has been finished, we can resume purge and we can reset the transaction IDs in the dictionary tables. Also, uh, worth men mentioning is that there is no drop table queue anymore. We removed it. We still use this uh, special file name prefix hash SQL dash IB during operations that are going to delete files. Those those operations will first internally inside InnoDB dictionary tables rename the table to that file name and then delete the record from, from these tables and the dictionary tables. And after commit, this uh, hash SQL dash IB file will be removed. So that, that, that guarantees that uh, we, we don't have a problem with those. And of course, we fixed something. Something main reason for, for this background drop table queue was that uh, the error handling of create table select was attempting drop table if it encountered a duplicate key error or a timeout during the execution, it would try to execute the drop table on the table while another transaction was still open doing this insert into that table in the same thread but a different transaction. So we fix that inside InnoDB so that we allow this operation to drop the table and then we don't need this background queue hack. For statistics tables, uh, we did some fixes as well. And uh, one more fix in the 10.6.5 release is that uh, the background tasks that will modify these tables, they will acquire proper metadata log. Not only on the actual user table, but also on the statistics tables. And then, then they will acquire exclusive log on the statistics tables, and finally, acquire the data dictionary cache latch for ex executing, executing the internal in a DBSQL code to modify the tables. So I believe that now there shouldn't be any more hangs or caches, even if there was a concurrent DDL on that user table or the statistic tables. Finally, what can we still do? What is left to be done? Well, one thing is, I think that uh, the foreign key metadata needs to be stored outside of storage engines. So instead of having these inner internal tables, sys foreign and sys foreign calls, we should store that metadata in the SQL layer. For example, in .frm files. That is, we should store not only the references, constraints, but also child table names. Like if a different another table is referring to a parent table with a references core clause, then the parent table must somehow be aware of this child table. So maybe we should store the child table name in the parent table.frm file. And to achieve this, of course, we would have to update the metadata for multiple tables atomically. So if that is multiple.frm files, then we have to do that. And that could be done by extending the DDL recovery log file. There are some challenges around uh, updating. We would have to still support uh, the old metadata tables. If we find those tables inside InnoDB, we would have to read the metadata, the foreign key constraints from, from those tables. And on DDL, we would have to delete the metadata and finally drop those tables. So both the old and new met the metadata formats would have to be supported. And this would still not remove foreign key processing itself from InnoDB. That would be a separate task to move the foreign key like on update cascade, that kind of processing to the SQL layer. After Atomic DDL, 
if we wanted to aim higher, we could go for transactional DDL. One example of that would be to have this create table select executing in a single transaction. Of course, we don't want to lock the dictionary tables for the entire duration of the operation. That is a challenge and maybe it needs to be split in some way or we would have to defer the changes of the dictionary metadata until the commit or, or something like that. If, if we even want to implement that. And uh, one thing that I have been wanting to do for a long time is removing all the InnoDB dictionary tables and the InnoDB system table space. Of course that's a big project and uh, now with uh, after some experience from this task making the DDL grass safe in InnoDB or even I would say transactional inside InnoDB but not in the whole server I think that it's not that bad design, this uh, InnoDB dictionary tables. It was only misused by incorrect uh, locking and logging around it. But if we removed uh, the InnoDB dictionary tables, then we would have to introduce, to make this uh, rename and drop operations explicit in the undo log. So we would have to some uh, we would need some unlock record types to cover these operations. Now we get it by monitoring changes to the dictionary tables. And a uh, bit related to that, uh, I think we must add some metadata into dot IPD files anyway. For example, the index root page numbers are missing from there. So it could be useful to to remove the dictionary tables altogether from InnoDB or to have some SQL layer cache table that contains all the table definitions so that you don't have to read all small .frm files on startup. But that's definitely something in the far future. Also something for the far future would be a multi-version dictionary cache and uh, combined DDL DM and DML transactions. For example if some transaction started and rename, re, uh, rename the table, then other transactions should still see the table with the old name. That would require a multi-version dictionary cache. There is also some challenge how to store the metadata for the internal tables that the InnoDB full text index is using, but I guess we could cover that by storing some more metadata in .ibd files. So that is all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention and I'm glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, welcome. Thank you, Marco. A very clear and very detailed explanation as always. Uh, so first question is on the performance impact. So 10.5, the focus was on performance improvements and in 10.6, there's been a couple of changes. There's a, a new log file, the DDL uh, recovery log. But at the same time, you did a few, uh, a few improvements. You removed the access mutex. You, you talked about removing the drop table Q hack. Uh, what, what is the impact um, of the uh, crash safe um, uh, in 10.6 on performance overall? Crash safe well, DDL. I haven't measured that, uh, maybe I should have, but I think that there might actually be a performance improvement in this area as well, because, because uh, we, uh, when we, we are creating a new data file, like create table or an alter table, optimized table that is rebuilding the table or even truncate table. If we used to do it so that, uh, that we write and synchronize the first page, a dummy first page for the, Dot .ibd file. And we are not doing that anymore because we are using this uh, pure write-ahead logging. So we are only writing the redo log that uh, we, are we have created this file and, and recovery may find that file as being an empty file or, or fit with zero bytes and uh, it will do its trick based on the redo log records. So it might actually be faster. Of course there is some extra overhead uh, because we now have this uh, atomic DDL log that needs to be 
durable return. So if you are running on a hard disk, then probably your your uh, DDL operations will see one more F sync. But but on the other hand, we don't have these F syncs uh, when creating the files, so it's difficult to say. I, I I didn't measure the performance. Okay, then talking about metadata logs, one thing I noticed almost as an aside is that. Um, the variable lock weight timeouts. So that uh, the, the, the default reduced from one year to one day. I think it was 10.6. I can't remember the the uh, the version. One year seems a kind of infeasibly long period. What was the thinking behind changing the default there? I don't know. I, I wasn't involved with that. I only remember that the default used to be one year back in MySQL 5.5 .5 or or 5.6. I, I didn't follow when, when it was changed in in MariaDB. Okay, so it doesn't seem to have any notable impact on, on INRDB at least. Yeah, in any case, uh, there is uh, regarding timeouts uh, on the InnoDB side, uh, we now have this variable InnoDB lock weight timeout, which is uh, being enforced a bit quicker than it used to be. But that's a topic of my other talk. We, we have a cleaner lock weights there. Okay, then you, you talked about um, sys table spaces and sys data files and those are were both removed. And then of the corresponding information schema, INDB sys table spaces and INDB sys data files. So sys data files was removed, um, but sys table spaces now just reflects the, the file system from 10.6. Can you talk about a bit about the relationship between the the internal INRDB tables and the information schema tables and why in particular sys table spaces was retained. Well, I wanted to make it, keep it simple for, for users. So I wanted to reduce the impact uh, to re reduce any surprises. That, that was basically the reasoning. Uh, I, I'm not particularly happy with these uh, system tables and uh, exposing them in the to the user user shouldn't really rely on on that information but it was easy to preserve this one and it wasn't a pure view of of the system tables in the first place it it did show some extra information already so i thought that it's uh, the least amount of surprise if we just keep it as is or only delete the underlying persistent table, which was kind of redundant, only causing potential inconsistencies. Then you, you talked about the sys tables that the, the problem caused by the primary key um, uh, not being the table ID, but being the table name. So that, that um, required a new uh, undo log record for, for rename table. What would the consequences have been if you simply changed the primary key? Why was that not an option? Well, it, uh, this is uh, something that uh, already was done in, uh, I think, uh, version uh, uh, 10.2.19. A couple of years ago, this analog record was added. So it's uh, not something that uh, happened recently. But back then, I wasn't, didn't even realize all these things. And I, I didn't realize that we can actually do crash safe DDL without changing any unlock formats, any further unlock format changes. But uh, I guess it would have been possible to to detect the rename table operation by somehow buffering multiple unlock records, bo both the delete mark and, and the insert record for changing the name. It would have been possible, but it was much easier when we had just one record that uh, reflect the rename. Okay. Then you talked about transactional DDL and you used the phrase, if we even want to, to implement that. So it seems to be one of the more commonly requested features on JIRA. It's, it's got quite a lot of votes um, and I quite often see blogs or, or articles about it. So I think the answer seems to be to be yes. You spoke about some of the, the, the requirements for that, like um, metadata being written into the IBD files. And then you also mentioned that specifically if you want to do if you want to do combined DDL and DML transactions, that has other requirements like a multi-version dictionary cache. What um, can you talk a bit more about that and why that relegates that um, into the far future? Well, that's uh, 
something that is not really my area of expertise. Those changes would have to be done mostly outside the storage engine. Uh, only this, uh, if we replace the InnoDB system tables with something else, then we would have to write that extra information into the InnoDB data files to make them kind of self-contained. But uh, the rest, uh, this uh, atomic DDL, I think uh, we will have to discuss that uh, with Monty and others who are more familiar with, with the SQL layer table definition cache and so on. And I, I don't know if it's even feasible to have this multi-version uh, dictionary cache. Maybe it's a reasonable limitation that, that we don't, don't allow, uh, that, that we do some kind of uh, locking like we, like we currently do for, for these DDL operations. But still, you, you might want to have it so that uh, if you have combined DDL and DML transaction, you would want to keep them atomic so that if you roll back, then all your drop table, create table, and update, insert, delete will be rolled back atomically. For that, we don't need a multi-version uh, dictionary cache. We can do that with locking. But obviously, if, if, if you then would have a, a large uh, transaction, which would uh, at the same time be blocking some popular table that other transactions are using, it, it wouldn't be a good idea to have such a huge DDL, DML transaction blocking everybody else. But that's a kind of a how users are, are using it. Okay. Then, then final question. You mentioned um, some of the challenges with uh, internal tables that full text index is using. And I know elsewhere you've mentioned the problem is caused by, by full text index and that at some point you would like to replace full text index with um, some sort of cross engine full text search functionality. Can you speak a little bit more about, about that and some of the issues that full text indexes cause and what you would like to do with it? Well, that's um, mostly just uh, venting out some frustration or, or it's uh, only at the hand waving level. I don't have any specific plans and it might be that uh, when I start to look at some replacement, then I notice that, okay, it's green, uh, the grass is not greener on the other side of the fence either. I don't know, but ba basically, uh, problem. One problem with the full text index implementation is that it it uses uh, the InnoDB internal SQL parser. We have such a thing. I, I would like to remove it, but maybe we can even if if we remove the, the InnoDB internal dictionary tables. Maybe it would be possible to rewrite the the refactor the InnoDB internal parser to somehow get the metadata of these uh, internal full text tables uh, from, from the IBD file metadata, which we would have to add, add there. It's, it's not really necessary to, uh, to, re to remove or replace the full text index implementation, but it, uh, it's just uh, something that would be convenient if we could uh, just have something easy that works and is efficient and cross engine. I don't know if such a thing exists. I have, haven't uh, spent time on researching that. Well, I think that's all we have time for for now. So thanks very much for being here with us. Till next time. Okay, thank you. It was very nice to be here. Thank you.